So let me ask you this one first. Okay. That you've had a chance to look at. Um, we talked about this before, actually, with Dr. King's movement in the 60s and how BLM is different. And um, so how do you view the civil rights movement back in the 60s to what you're doing now and the differences and the need to do it your way? Um, I think we look at the different movements um, from history, whether it be the Black Panther Party or the civil rights or Martin Luther King, um, and we take bits and pieces of what we think that they did good strategically. And then we also look at things where we feel like we may have failed as a people, and we try to grow from it and learn from it and um, do things better this go round. But I think also in that era, um, they were fighting for freedom, but for different aspects. So right now I feel like, you know, we've progressed a little bit, but then we've taken a lot of steps back and then we've seen things evolve, not so much in a good way, but kind of the same thing, just with a different name or a different look. And so we're, we're fighting more aggressively, I feel like now. But I wasn't there, so I can't really speak to um, exactly how it was done back then. I just know that we're trying to fight more aggressively now because we're tired. We shouldn't have to be fighting still. It's been 50 years since Martin Luther King was assassinated. On Wednesday it will be. And um, we shouldn't still have to fight for, for freedom and to live and have justice and be treated equally and have equity, so. You mentioned fighting, and, and we had talked about this before with Black Lives Matter. Initiating contact, initiating change, getting in people's faces. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of that right now. Mm -hmm. Explain. Okay, um, I mean, basically, what we've done in the past didn't work. We're still where we're at. So we're doing things more aggressively. But on top of that, you're talking about someone that was killed by the police. So they have a family, they've got friends, their friends and family are traumatized, they're in pain. The community is traumatized. Um, we've been seeing this going on. I've been seeing this for the last three years in the city. So um, just imagine that building up. I, there's Rev, Rev Kev, they call him. He's with SAC Act. Um, he did a, an, an analogy the other day, and he said, if, if you drop a brick on your foot, it's going to hurt, and you're going to scream. And there's a lot of people saying, don't scream so loud. Um, you know, and he probably said it way more eloquent than I can because he's a pastor, but, um, but that's basically it. Like, we're in pain, so we're going to react to our pain, and it's valid and anger doesn't equate to violence, so that's important to know. In our last visit, you also mentioned that there had been some recent activity or movement on BLM's part with which to help people when they encounter police on how to get through it and deal with it later. Right. That didn't, that didn't necessarily seem to happen in this case. What are you talking about, with Stefan? If you could talk to Stefan now, what would you tell him to have done that night? I wouldn't have told him to do anything. Is is he running allegedly and evading? It didn't it didn't go well. Yeah, I'm not going to speak to what happened as far as what he did and putting any blame on him um, because I don't know. I've heard different instances of what actually happened that the media is not putting out. So I'm not going to speak to that. Um, but Stefan is not here, but the officers that killed him, they are here. So it should be, what should they have done right? What should they have not done that night? Um, because they're the ones that made the mistake. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a few veterans since this has happened, and a lot of them say that when you're in the military, there are very strict rules of when you shoot somebody. And it's usually, it's only after you've seen them brandishing a gun or if they've shot at you. Um, and at that point, if you've shot them before any of those things have happened, if they don't have a gun or they have not shot at you, then as a soldier, you go to jail, you go to jail, military jail. So that, I feel like, you know, and they're saying that, that what the police are doing is way too extreme and it's way too careless. So I think our police need to be revamping how they do things. Um, and I think it's something that they need to look at. Have you talked to the chief about what you just told him? No. Do you want to talk to the chief? No. Why? The chief the chief has heard my voice. We went to city council while you were gone. The community was in that space. Hundreds of people were there. Chief Han was there. Um, I don't know if he heard us because he was looking at his phone the whole time. 
And when the folks told him to pay attention, he kind of rolled his eyes because he was told to pay attention. But the voices have been heard by him. And I'm not, I don't think I want to sit down and hear what he has to say about it. He said enough through the press release and things like that. Um, it's, it's a travesty what happened. And so he needs to fix that. However, he has the ability to do that. And the city manager needs to fix it. However, the, he has the ability to do that. So when you talk about fixing something, what would you like to see fixed if, if police of any color encounter people of color and they say stop or whatever, what do you want people to do when they encounter the police? So I'm, you keep going back to what people should do and I'm, I think we need to put the, the ball in the police's court because okay. it's their responsibility to protect and serve us. Um, we are the taxpayers that pay their salaries. So um, the things that we're asking for or demanding at this point is we're demanding things at three different levels, the city, the county, and the state. At the city level, we're um, demanding that um, the city manager fire those officers. Um, second, we have a commission, an oversight commission. We want that commission to have a lot more power and reflect the community a lot more and we need it to be the party that does the investigations of the officers after a police-involved shooting. Um, lastly, with the city, the use of force policy needs to be changed. The language in it is subjective. It leaves too much room for interpretation, and that's not, when it comes to people's lives, that's not acceptable. I feared for my life is not a reason to justify murdering somebody. Um, at the county level, we want the DA to, to press charges so that there can be a conviction because that's the end goal for this situation. Um, and then at the state level, we want the Bill of Rights, the peace officers or the police officers' Bill of Rights to be changed. And same with the use of force policy, just change the subjective language and then add in there some transparency and accountability measures. Um, so those are the things that we're demanding um, at this time. And I feel personally like all of these things, if they all happened, if there's repercussions for the actions of officers, you'll see less of these things happening. If there's legislation put in place or ordinances put in place that, um, that require accountability, then you're gonna see this happening less or not at all. So I feel like we need to just do a whole revamp of the system. Most times these investigations find the officers not guilty. Mm -hmm. They go back to the beat. What's your plan? Because you know that likely will happen. Mm. What's your plan? My for plan that? is to follow the people's lead. That's what I'm here for. Everything we do, I'm following the people's lead. These people are friends and family of, of Stefan. So I'm following their lead. Mm -hmm. Their pain and their anger is, is valid, and I'm following it. Is this different with Stefan Clark than has happened before in this town or in other situations? It's not Tamir different. Rice or anything? Do you look at this as a continuation of the same thing? It's the same thing happening, and I, I think it's a problem when we continue to ignore it in between each death. Or it's not even in between each death. It's between any death that has very high visibility um, because there's a lot of deaths that have happened in between that don't get a lot of media attention. Um, but I think that it's a problem when we ignore it in between because it is one big problem that's ongoing for decades. So it needs to be addressed that way. Mm -hmm. Do you care what people think about you? Not really. I'm not here for them to think a certain way about me. I'm not here to be a public figure. I'm here to fight for my people. Okay, uh, I put out I want to ask you some questions from viewers. I don't really want to answer those questions. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there's. So I saw the ones on your page, and I was really. There's a lot of people. Okay. Yeah. I mean, maybe if can I look at them? Um. Okay. Here's an easy one. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll just do it that way. Okay. I, I'm I'm willing to work with you. Okay. Lisa asks, "What do you think would make it better for all of us?" Hmm. That's a really broad question. Um. As far as law enforcement goes, the, the demands that I named, um, but as far as living our lives um, as being black and white folks wanting to show up or non-black folks wanting to show up, um, I just feel like people need to acknowledge um, their privilege. And I don't mean privilege as in you have a silver spoon, but more so that our skin creates certain oppressions that we go through. Everybody either benefits of 
from either history or they reap the, the, the bad things that are coming from history. So I feel like we need to acknowledge that um, because today in this age, while you may be a white person and you may be living your life and be comfortable and you may not see what's going on, but we're living it every day. Whether somebody's letting a door shut in my face or calling me the N-word or stereotyping me um, or you can look at Parkland when students rise up and they protest and they're honored and they're lifted. When black folks rise up and protest, we're discouraged um, or we're called names or criticized. Um, so I feel like people need to acknowledge those things and then change the way that they live their lives and be very mindful of it and intentional with it. One thing I said yesterday in a commentary is, and I'm in, trying to interpret what's happening here with BLM in the city, mm -hmm. is that this is somewhat about Stephen Clark, but it's more about a continuation of 1890s Mississippi on right. with shootings, lynchings of black people. Yep. Is this a continuation, you feel? These are modern day, modern day lynchings. This is absolutely what that is. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Scott asks about, We'll go, we'll go back to something we, we had mentioned earlier about, about Stefan. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you said that he wasn't there, but this is something you had asked before. Scott wants to know if, if Stefan was... Scott wants to know about Stefan running from the police, mm -hmm. whether or not if he had just stopped and whatever, whether this had had a better ending. I don't know that that happened. From what I've heard, he was actually not running from police. So I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I know that Stefan was shot first in his side, his left side, which means he was facing his house, going into it, because that's how his family got into the house, through the back door. Mm -hmm. And I know that swung his body around to where his back was to officers, and they shot him seven times in his back. And I know that his brain was alive for 35 minutes, and they didn't get him any medical attention. So I don't care if he was running. I don't care if he was a marathon runner running from police. That shouldn't have happened the way. We have a justice system. While I may not believe in it, it's mm -hmm. in place. And so he should have gotten his chance in court. There shouldn't be a helicopter out there for somebody that may be stealing cars. That's a waste of our tax dollars. All your viewers, I'm, I'm assuming they care about their tax dollars. We shouldn't be using helicopters for that. Um, and then we shouldn't be lying about the events that take place, hoping that the family can't afford a separate autopsy to prove what really happened. So I just, I, I'm not, his question is irrelevant. <laughs> okay. Um, here's one which I think is fair. Do you feel sometimes that black people run from police because they're non-compliant or guilty, or are they in fear of the police? So I think we are in fear of the police, but I also want to steer away from any type of information that has been given to us by the police. So police are always saying that we're running away from them. I don't think that that's always the case. I think with Joseph Mann it was because there was a car coming at him, but I think a lot of times they say we've run from them or we're charging at them. Um, and I don't always believe that that's happening. But yeah, I think as black people, it's very common um, that we are afraid of the police and that we get anxiety and we're traumatized and we suffer mental health issues because of our communities and the relationship of, that we have with the police. One thing I hear a lot about with, with black folks is driving while black. Mm -hmm. Is that the part where there's the most encounter with law enforcement, where black people are pulled over driving their cars? If and, you drive. And then, and it's just, you're like, why are you pulling me over? Right. Is that where most of this happens? I don't think most of it, but it happens often if you're driving. But there's a lot of, so we're by Sac High right now, and there's a lot of kids that walk home from school and they get pulled over, detained, and sat down on the curb by police officers on a regular basis. For what? I, for anything. What do the officers say to them? They just... I pulled you over because of what? Well, I've heard, they heard we were throwing rocks at something, you know, little things like that. But they detain them for hours on the curb publicly um, when all they have to do is question them. Um, and those are our first experiences with police officers for young people. Um, I have an ex-boyfriend who, when he was 11, he was fishing in a creek over in Elder Creek, and the police pulled guns on them hmm. at 11 years old, him and his younger cousin. So, I mean, it's happening regularly. It's been happening since 
before my life started. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of fear through different situations. They're not always in your car. Sometimes they're walking, sometimes they're in a park, sometimes they're at night, sometimes they're coming home from work, walking. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think that the trauma is very real. Okay. Uh, Dave wants to know, would you be willing to do a ride along with SAC police or the sheriff's department just never, to see what they encounter? Never in my life. Why? I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I've already tried to build relationships with city government, including police chiefs and sergeants. And I've sat down with cadets and given them information on how they could be better in black communities. I've tried to build and it's only wasted my time and I'm not here to waste my time anymore. Um. Camille wants to know, do you believe that the tactics that are currently being used are gaining support of the majority of citizens? Are you interested in that? Um, I think that people have already pretty much chosen a side, probably since Trayvon Martin, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, this either mobilizes them or it has the people that don't like us officially not like us. Did the blocking of I-5 accomplish what you wanted or do you think it it, it, and it obviously upset a lot of people. Is that all come with it? So to be very thorough, our goal when we protest is to either in, to inform and to mobilize. Um, and so yes, I feel that we did accomplish that because a lot of people have come out to protest after that because they were stopped in traffic. Also, there were a lot of people that were stopped that jumped out and joined us. There were people in their trucks rooting with us, a truck driver. So yeah, I feel like it does it does, we do inch by inch achieve a goal. And I think the Golden One Center, that was a great a accomplishment because now the Kings are talking about it and we're working with them. That was a big get for you guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's one that's, that's sort of in the middle, not really, but <laughs> Bob wants to know, why do you hate people who don't see things your way? I don't hate anybody, I love everybody. I'm a loving person. Except for law enforcement. I don't hate, I don't hate police officers. Really? I hate the system. Okay. I hate the culture. So that's what I hate. Um, but yeah, I don't hate people, so that's inaccurate. That was a, that was a, a trollish comment of him. He doesn't know me. Oh, well, uh, believe me, I'm in, I'm in the business and I'm trolled constantly. Uh, I want him to know that, though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Tell I'll, him to get I'll, his life together. I will, I will use it. I think, <laughs> I think that that's... Um, that's it for the questions that I think you would want to um, want to talk about. Um, the only question I would ask you, and it's been brought up, whether or not the fact that one of them was an African American cop. Okay, I'll ask that. that I'll ask that. Yeah. Do you, do you know for sure that what that was the case? Yeah. Okay. So, one of the two police officers involved in the shooting was African American. What what's your feeling on that? So as I stated earlier, the police department or the police law enforcement agencies across the country, it's a culture. So regardless of your color, once you jump in on that culture, no matter what your intentions are, the easiest thing to do is to be a part of it. So once you, no matter if you're black, white, Japanese, Mexican, you're blue. You're blue. You're blue. Everybody's blue. That's Even Chief Han. He's blue. He's blue. You could see in his press statement. He's very blue. He's navy blue. <laughs> so, I guess the last question, Tanya, would be: yeah, the last question would be, um, are you satisfied with the aggression that you folks have had? Has it been successful, or do you see this ramping up? I see it ramping up. How so? I, somebody referred to Sacramento as a pressure cooker, so I could see that. I'm seeing that in the emotions of people. And you, if it ramps up, you're not going to try to control that. You, I mean, do you see destruction of property? Where, where how bad, how bad could this get? I don't know. I can't predict that. Um, I don't ever condone destruction of property. I believe in agitation and like, you know, doing the most that we can toward our target, but. Um, I don't know what the people are going to do. And you can't it's, control everybody. It's not my position to control people. Right. It's the police's. It's position. not. The, yeah. <laughs> I feel like people should be able to express themselves freely in this situation because it's horrible. Stefan is not here anymore. He does not get to see his babies. He does not get to go to college. He does not get to see his girlfriend anymore. His family misses him. They're mourning. His brother is going through a lot right now. 
this is affecting people in a huge way. So like what we could foresee to me is like, we need to foresee justice and that needs to happen by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. It needs to. A lot of people have pressured me saying, why haven't you talked more about Stefan's criminal past? Do you feel that that has anything to do with what happened that night? From what I heard, that the criminal past that came out was not even about him, it was about one of his relatives. I don't know any details about that, but I don't really care because like I said, um, we have a justice system and those officers, they played the judge and the jury and that shouldn't have happened. He should be able to go to court and have his day. And then if he had to do time, then that's what needs to happen. But I'm sure that breaking into a car, if that's actually what he was doing, doesn't give him a life sentence. I think a lot of people agree with that, that the breaking into the car, the 20 shots fired, <laughs> is that the biggest thing? I mean, outside of the fact that Stefan Clark is dead, the fact that there were 20 shots fired at a man who was suspected of breaking into a vehicle. What really impacted me personally is why did they have a helicopter? Why were they using a helicopter for someone that may have been breaking into cars? Um, another big question that I don't, there might be a bigger story behind it is why is it that the sheriff department used their helicopter and they're the ones that told on SAC PD to kind of distract attention from them that he had a cell phone and not a gun, which I'm glad that they did, but what does that mean? Why 20 shots? Why did you empty your guns at a young person? How do you see a gun with a white cell phone? Um, no return fire either. Right. How does, what impacted me the most after the second autopsy is, he was, his brain was alive for 35 minutes. How come you didn't get any type of medical help for him? Did it bother you that he was cuffed? It always bothers me when they cuff them after they've been killed, but I think that's part of their process, their procedure. Um, but why are you yelling at him for five minutes, asking if he's dead, um, if he's alive, to lift his arms? You just shot him up, and you want him to lift his arms? Like, I just, there's a lot of things in that video and through the autopsy that just, they, um, there's no word to even say how it makes me feel. It's anger and sadness and pain, and it's too much of it. It's heavy.